This is Shadon Larkey of Awards Daily. I'm here with Brian Fogel, the director of the new documentary, The Dissident, uh, of course, Academy Award winner for his work on Icarus. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today and uh, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I wanted to start with, you know, I've, I've heard you say that you wanted to do something dealing with misinformation um, and things like that. Why was Jamal Khashoggi the correct, you know, way to tell this story in the correct frame for? You know, uh, uh, coming out of Icarus, um, we're you know, what started as one journey ends up into a journey of protecting a whistleblower's life and bringing forward a, a story to the world that is still reverberating. A law was just passed, uh, signed into law to uh, protect against cheating in sport by uh, one of the few good things that Donald Trump did in his <laughs> departing of office is actually signed the Rachenkov Act into law, uh, which criminalizes doping in sport. Um, and so, you know, having come through this, this experience, um, I really wanted to continue to make film, but really tell stories that I felt could have a global impact. And, and you know, under the last several years, I've really felt that freedom of speech is, is under attack, freedom of press is under attack. And so many of these um, things that we take for granted in our country um, are not a given. And there are so many, the most of the world does not live with the power of freedom of press or freedom of speech. You don't have that in Russia. You don't even have that in Turkey. And you certainly don't have that in Saudi Arabia. And so as this murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi was coming forward to the world, uh, murder of a Washington Post journalist who was a moderate, uh, who left his country to go into self-exile, only because he wanted his country to be a freer place. He wanted women to have rights in his country. He wanted people to have rights in his country. He wanted freedom of opinion, freedom of thought. And that meant so much to him. He puts himself into self-exile and then is murdered essentially for tweeting his opinions, which are moderate opinions, which are the opinions of anybody living in a westernized country or democracy would have as to how a government should be run or how people should be able to express themselves. And to me, this story um, was one that I wanted to tell um, because it's, uh, I think it's a warning sign uh, for, for all of us. Um, and in the murder of Jamal, um, not only did we learn of you know, the horrendous human rights violations of the Saudi government, the story behind that is so much deeper. The, the U.S. ties to Saudi Arabia, how all the member countries of the G20 are willing to look the other way at these horrendous human rights abuses because of the money they hold, right? And, uh, and ultimately how there has been no justice to, to two plus years in uh, for his murder uh, because of all these economic and financial ties. Um, and so these were the things that really drew me uh, to the story and, you know, and made me want to, uh, to dive in on this journey to tell it. And you have this larger um, framing device of this young dissident in Montreal, Omar Abdulaziz. Why was his story sort of important for you to include and sort of have this framing of new world versus old world um, journalism and, and the young activist? Well, I, I think with the, the, the thing for me is that if I was going to take on this subject, um, I didn't want to tell a, an archival film. I wasn't looking to pull together tons of news clips and, uh, and, uh, and CNN footage about Jamal's murder. I wanted to craft a story that had relevance today, that matters now. Um, and in Omar, he is the story's protagonist because he is basically the young Jamal. He is the guy who is fighting um, the fight that Jamal can no longer fight. 
And his journey, as you see in the film, is not only um, continuing, but as the film closes, and you know, and, and the last thing we shot on this film was about a you know a, a year ago, right? Um, his brothers are in prison, his friends are imprisoned, and thousands of Saudi human rights activists, journalists remain in prison. Well, here we are, you know, two years and three months from Jamal's murder. And all of those facts still remain. So Omar's journey is not only one that is uh, the the kind of the, the thrust of the film. Um, it is continued, you know, as as of this moment. I mean, literally, I'm I was messaging with him right before I get on this call because he's showing me these, you know, what's happening on Twitter in Saudi Arabia right now, as they are basically, literally, they figured out a new algorithm of how to hack Twitter as you see in the film, but this is a new technique where they're able to go in and actually change the hashtags of what's trending in the country. And so Omar had got the hashtag trending of free Lu Jane, the Saudi woman's human rights activist who's spending the next six years on top of three life, nine years in her life for advocating that women should have a right to leave their home without the permission of a male guardian 18 years of older. I mean, go figure, Can you imagine? that if you're a woman in Saudi Arabia, you cannot leave your home without the permission of basically an 18 year old male who happens maybe to be your son. Your own son needs to grant his mother permission to leave the home. This is real. Mm -hmm. And these people are sitting in jail and, and, and today Saudi Arabia goes in and literally have figured out how to hack the algorithm and change what is trending instead of to freeing Lujain and Lujain is on a hunger strike now. They've changed the, the, the hashtags to just read free, hunger, and delete. I mean, this is, this, is, this is as real as it gets. Mm -hmm. So Omar, uh, this is why I wanted to focus on Omar because he is, he is one of the few free voices um, that are Saudi that are living with, outside of that country that are continuing to speak truth to power and fighting for all of these people um, imprisoned or living under this repressive regime. In terms of the spread of misinformation, I mean, what do you think can be done? Is it just government intervention? I mean, what's it gonna take, do you think? I think, I think what we are seeing um, is that um, uh, there is a real change. There is a sweeping change that is starting to come with Biden. Two days ago, he did a massive thing. He blocked uh, arm sales to Saudi Arabia and United Emirates. Trump had tried to push through another 500 million in arm sales on his closing days of office. First thing Biden does is he came in and blocked those arm sales. And then blocking those armed cells, he cited the war in Yemen and he cited the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. So clearly there is a desire here with Biden and the incoming administration to hold the Saudis accountable and to change that relationship. And so the question is, is what, what happens now? And can there be enough pressure put on the kingdom that they are forced to free people like Lujan al-Hatul and Hassan Lazamo and these thousands of, of political prisoners that sit in jail. Um, I don't think you know, there's any idea that Mohammed bin Salman will be standing trial, but I think that there is um, a, a really positive moment and, and it is one of the reasons why we wanted to hold on releasing the film because we knew that you know, under Trump um, there was nothing all that you were going to do is just have another thing of like, oh, okay, yeah, of course. And now I think the film can serve a, um, a really powerful place for members of Congress, Senate, activists, individuals, people to see this, to see this film and go, okay, this is the time that we can actually do something about it. So I'm feeling very optimistic about that. And I'm curious, Brian, do you consider yourself a journalism, a journalist? What's your view on modern journalism? Obviously, you said you're concerned about freedom of speech, but, you know, I, I think that the norms of journalism have shifted so much over the past four years and covering Trump. 
what's your view on that? Where do we go from here? You know, is objectivity still something that can be maintained? I, I, I think that, you know, um, I consider myself a journalist um, and I consider myself a filmmaker, um, you know, that, that seeks to tell stories um, that speak truth to power, that, um, you know, help hopefully, uh, uh, you know, enlighten, um, you know, uh, uh, others into dark corners of the world or into subject matter uh, that they might know about, meaning I think there's huge awareness in the world of the Washington Post journalist who walked into the Saudi consulate and was murdered. But that's the majority of what people know. Oh yeah, I heard about that story. They don't know that story, the why, the how, and what is at stake. And so, you know, so I consider myself a, a, a journalist, an investigative journalist, and a filmmaker, and an activist, and that I use my abilities to make film um, to try to craft stories that can bring change in the world. And in the film, uh, you've said that, you know, you had the cooperation to some extent of the Turkish government. There are new revelations and, uh, and, and audio that we've never heard before. Tell me about that. And what I'm interested in is this building of trust that you had to do. You don't have to give away your secrets, but I mean, how do you craft that relationship to where you're able to achieve this? Because it's truly astounding. You know, I, I, I think um, it really comes from the approach. Um, when I approach subjects and go after something, um, I'm really focused on approaching from, uh, from the level of, of, of humanity, of being a human, of being someone that cares um, and not coming in with a camera like, here I am in your face. Um, and, 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 and it's about patience and taking that time to build the relationship. And so in the case of the Turks, from the time of my first meeting to them giving me the transcript was a year and two months. Uh, over those year and two months, I spent eight months in Istanbul. For every one day that I would maybe shoot, I spent five or six days in meetings building trust. And meeting after meeting, coffee after coffee, you know, tea after tea, saying, look, I'm, I'm not here to disparage Turkey. What I am here is that I want to be able to tell the truthful story, the real story behind the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. You guys hold the key to that. Will you let me interview you? Will you give me the footage? Will you, will you give me the evidence? Because I think I can help you, Turkey, because you're fighting for justice in this murder. And let's leave the politics out of it. Let's leave what maybe Turkey's intentions are, why they're doing this, but it doesn't matter. Matters is this guy was murdered in your country. You want to seek justice for him. I have a platform to do that. And if you trust me and I trust you, we can try to achieve those goals together. And that was the same approach that I took with the Tisha Jengas, same approach that I took with Omar Abdulaziz, which nothing was going in there like, here I am with the camera and here I am going to, it was building a friendship first, building trust, talking about your goals, talking about what you want to achieve, talking about what matters, getting to learn and understand and know someone, what they're going through. And with the Tija, again, it was, we were talking almost every day and I spent five weeks in Istanbul, you know, for two and a half months before she agreed to let me start filming with her. And, Ultimately, she started, she agreed to let me film with her because she knew that I was going to protect her because I promised her that I was going to protect her. I promised her I wasn't going to put things in the film that might embarrass her. I promised her that I cared about Jamal, which I do. I promised her that we were going to go on this journey together, which we did. And I did the same thing with Omar. And so I think the, the approach um, is probably different that and I think a lot of you know you're you're journalists you're going out and okay you're trying to write a story for the New York Times and you got a week to do that you got two weeks to do that 
I'm going in and I'm really in like, you know, I, I started making this film two years and three months ago. And, and yet this is still 85% of my bandwidth every day. So, um, you know, so I think uh, that that approach um, ultimately allowed that trust and access to, to be gained. Um, are you planning a follow up? Do you have another idea that you're ruminating on? What's next for you and what's next for the film and for you know, these, these topics that, that are so front of mind right now? Well, I, I think um, what's, what's next for the film is, uh, you know, it's out on VOD so people can finally see it uh, in the U.S. and Canada. It'll be released uh, in different uh, global markets, you know, uh, around the world over the coming months. You know, I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, there might be some uh, recognition for the awards season, uh, not not for myself, I could care less about that, but um, that could have a real impact in bringing more people to the film and letting people see this story that is so urgent and that I think, and I'm so passionate about. I mean, we just, we can't let journalists walk into consulates to be murdered and chopped into pieces with Zuby. That's the world that we're living in. That is not a good place. Um, and so, you know, so I'm optimistic that that, um, uh, that, that may come. And, um, and, and so much of what I'm doing just before the call with you, I was on a call with the committee to protect journalists and they're working, uh, you know, they've got a lawsuit right now to try to release all the intelligence findings into Jamal's murder to find out if Trump knew about this, to find out, you know, um, uh, and to pressure the Biden administration to take action. And so I'm very involved on an activist level and on other projects. Um, I have two uh, other documentaries that are in production right now. Uh, both that are, you know, tackling uh, subject matter that I that I deem uh, important. Um, another one that I'm kind of wading my toe in that, again, is a, a story that I think can, you know, hopefully bring some change. And then I've got a scripted project uh, with a big studio, but it's around a another true, uh, true uh, political story and a political murder. Uh, and one that uh, there's still been no justice on. So just trying to keep on this uh, this path. Well, um, I guess the real question is, do you get any sleep? <laughs> Somewhat, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're working. <laughs> Brian, thank you so much for your time. Such an honor to get to talk to you. We can't wait to see what you do next. Uh, thank you for yeah, appreciate it. bring attention to this incredible, incredible film. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.